is um, bring in a bus of, of, of 2,000 screaming dykes to bust up our conference. <laughs> And it's a, good, it's a good thing we weren't Skyping, you know, and, and, and there was no television because I managed in my most serious voice to say to her, oh my goodness, no, we only do that to Catholics. <laughs> oh, but do you remember the years of the Lavender Menace? When, oh my there, there were, on the national level, some strange moments. When Betty Friedan got on television and talked about uh, money going from uh, the government to uh, forces that we're going to undermine now. And I seem to remember, maybe it was you, I don't remember, who said, boy, I certainly wish they, somebody was going to give us a great deal of money. And <laughs> because it wasn't me, but I would have said it. <laughs> but it and it was just one of those moments that, uh, and we were very lucky because I think there was very, very little, if any, of that within our very, local chapter. None that I, and certainly none that I was aware of. Well, I, I wouldn't want people to think that we were perfect. We did get cranky with each other on occasion. That's true. <laughs> and especially one of the things I noticed that every February, you know, a lot of us would just start sniping at each other and be angry at each other. And, and I wonder if that was a biorhythm that had to do with nature, um, or if it had to do with the fact that by every February we had lost the ERA yet again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the one year we didn't push the ERA, February was a nice month. Uh, and it, it's a, a lesson I've tried to carry to my other work that, you know, and the, and the statement is that vertical violence breeds horizontal hostility. And we were susceptible to that in the early years uh, until we realized what was going on um, and stopped taking out our disappointment on each other. Uh, now, not that it lasted forever, but <laughs> we could be really cranky with each other for about a month. Well, how, how did you, know, you all of us have invested so much? And right. I think there, there were those times that we really were down, you mm -hmm. know, when you just reached that point of exhaustion. And I think that the laughter that we shared in so many of these absurd situations, there were women who could see the core of the absolute absurdity Mm -hmm. of what was happening on some level. And I think that laughter helped carry us through a lot of hard times. Mm -hmm. Because we faced defeat over and over again. And when we went to do the fast in Illinois, we knew it was going down. We weren't there because we thought somehow we were going to win, but rather we needed to witness and to be a presence and to, to come back from it. And I will never forget the kind of outpouring of love and care that came to us in Illinois. It was just amazing. Uh, we had started out in a church that had agreed to take us in. And then they discovered uh, the ERA was the core of what we were gonna fast about. And uh, so they decided to evict us. And um, that was the point at which Ellie said, you know, the women's church will never close the door on women. And she was the one then now picked us, picked, essentially got us a place to stay. Mm -hmm. But Dixie Johnson, who drove we used to drive without maps and with a compass in the front of her car, drove from the state of Washington to Illinois to take care of us. Mm -hmm. There were women who came literally from all around the country. And who, but we also were so aware of the edge of grief that was terribly profound, I think, for many, many of us. And I think after, after, I came out of the hospital, went to D.C., got to D.C., and got grabbed and told, you're going down to the ABC uh, studio, 
and you're going to debate Phyllis Schwann. <laughs> and <laughs> it was one of the more surreal experiences of my entire life. What happened? Because Phyllis went to law school and had the education she did because other women had sued. Other women had gone ahead of her and broken away <coughs> for her. And she never in her life has ever acknowledged that women helped women. It really was uh, the most amazing situation. Uh, and all I could say to her is, it would be really nice if you had a bit of gratitude for those women who went before you and opened all the doors you have walked through. Mm -hmm. Cornelia would be proud of you. <laughs> Ellie <laughs> Steele always said that the way to win an ERA debate with Phyllis Schlafly was to bring up the Panama Canal. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> yes, to bring yeah, up the Panama you. Canal because she really, Anti-ERA, anti-feminism was simply a vehicle for her to remain in the public spotlight. Absolutely. And to have a, a, a power base. That's all it was. She was really a, an old right-wing hardliner. And you brought up the Panama Canal and she just went off. What's uh, what's Man, I'm missing something here because I don't know what's so Well, the, you know, the real conservatives is we've got to defend the Panama Canal oh. because you know, our, our you know, national security depends on us having control over the Panama Canal. And we built it and stole that land fair and square, so it's ours. Yes, exactly. exactly. Oh, it was, it was so interesting because when we, when we got to Illinois, we first of all found, tried to find a doctor who would kind of look out for us and do blood tests regularly as we were going through the fast. And the fast ended up being almost 40 days. And it was a young Canadian doctor who was the only doctor in Springfield, Illinois, who would offer us any services, take, take the risk of being in that position. And that's because he could go home to where good medicine was practiced. <laughs> <laughs> but, and still is. Yeah. And, uh, sorry, my chauvinism coming out. One of the things that we had to deal with early on, and this may sound like a strange small piece, but he really did a lot of research on long-term fasting, and this was around the time of the hunger strikers in Ireland, mm -hmm. in Belfast. Uh -huh. And so he said, you must be very careful about the water you drink. If this is going to be a long fast, if this goes all the way down to the end, you don't want to be collecting certain sorts of minerals or chemicals in your bodies because you're not eating anything that the, the whole system of washing out is not gonna work as well. So he did some research, and it turned out that the water company, the bottled water company that Phyllis Schlafly's husband owned and ran, was the only available water in Springfield, Illinois, that we were supposed to drink. And it was hysterical, because we had this long, long debate about whether we were going to be giving profits to Phyllis and her husband. <laughs> but <laughs> she drank Perrier. Perrier, no. Uh -huh. No, no. And I still ate their electrolytes went down. That's what we were told back here. No, we, we drank Phyllis's husband's water. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it it was kind of hysterical. And we would hide the bottles. <laughs> <laughs> we, would, we would put the, a Mountain Valley water into other bottles oh, to take down to the, uh, to the capital where we were sit sitting each day. And it was, and Phil, one of Phyllis's actions, it, on one day there were 40 women from Carbondale, Illinois that came and unwrapped and then ate candy bars in front of us. Mm -hmm. And it was the darndest thing I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, it was so strange because it was so out of context with the reasons why we were there and why the other women were there. It was bizarre. It was one of those moments of just 
almost it was comedy. Well, it was comedy almost because it was so strange. I would have called it hateful. I would have too. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of Heidi, Lily Yubakuchili, who was a very funny woman and and a very interesting feminist who lived completely in her head. Lily eventually got breast cancer and eventually it metastasized and to her brain cancer. And her, the last six months of her life were very interesting. She's the only person I know who organized and made all the phone calls for her own week because we had it two months early so she could go. Um, and it was a great party. It was wonderful. Um, and it was the day after Thanksgiving, right? At Mary's place. At Mary's it was place. At Mary's place. We I don't all remember brought our, the day. our leftover it, Thanksgiving I to Mary's uh, part. I don't remember, but I remember in January when I was down at her place to visit her, and she was she was fading, and she knew that. And she really wanted a pizza. <laughs> And the only people in her neighborhood who would deliver were Domino's Pizza, oh. who we were boycotting because they were bad. And but she said, but I really want a pizza. So I ordered the pizza, she said. We had pizza. And she made me take the Domino's box home in my trunk so her daughter wouldn't catch her. I <laughs> <laughs> in the water bottles. You know? and, and I took the Domino's Pizza box home in my trunk so and she I wouldn't get caught. I would. I remember the battle. Willie wanted to come home from the hospital. She really oh. wanted to die at home, and this was before hospice. And, and Pat, you moved mountains so that oh. she could the die in the kind of peace and in the place she wanted to be. Yeah. And in those days, hospitals were very rigid about this. So it was the insurance company. They had three times in a row said she could be discharged and they would provide some home nursing, which they didn't do in those days, it was 89. And uh, they had three times taken that approval back. And I got a phone call at, at my college, which was way up in Maryland, from her one day, and, and I know a suicide threat by human. And she said, they were going to let me go home and today at three o'clock they told me I couldn't. And so if I have to die in this hospital, I might as well die tomorrow. Which is a very scary thing to hear one of your friends say. And I said, no, don't do that. I'll come down and see you at night, which I didn't usually do because you couldn't get there from Columbia, Maryland, and I was, it, it was just a bad night. And I was also supposed to be at the board of directors meeting at the college because they were greeting the new faculty. And I just called them up over and came down to see Willie. And we talked a lot and we, developed a plan that we were going to ask her doctor if she could have a weekend pass so she'd feel better. And I got home and listened to my answering machine, and it was the poor case manager from the insurance company who was asking me if I would voluntarily provide home nursing care for her. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, she would never have asked me. <laughs> and when I called her the next morning, she said, well, we've talked to her daughter. I said, no, her daughter can't. And I said to, to the lady, I said, I understand you're the case manager, but you're the case manager, and so here we go. I said, are you a publicly held company? She said, what do you mean? I said, do you have stockholders? And if so, when is the stockholders meeting? And she said, well, I don't know. And I said, well, will you find out? Because you could call me yesterday, you can call me today, and, and let me know. I said, Willie and I go back a long way, and we're really good at demonstrating. And we'd be really happy to come to your stockholders meeting. Willie would look good in a wheelchair. And I have an MBA, and I can explain to your stockholders why you are not willing to pay for any home care, but you're willing to pay thousands of dollars a day to keep her in the hospital when she doesn't need to be in the hospital. And she didn't, she took home. What we had asked for the day before, or had been promised in Renee, was four hours a day of home care five days a week. That's all we, we could, we could, we could made it with that. And I, I was, I was so livid. It was eight o'clock in the morning and I don't do well at eight o'clock in the morning and I had to be at school and that, and I said, I'm sorry that, you know, I'm taking it out of you, but you're the case manager. And I said, we'd, we'd look real good at your stockholders meeting and they'd understand what if I can you know, provided my, my charts about how much more it's costing them. I said, uh, 
So you, you'll let me know, right? No, no, not much. From the other, by three o'clock that afternoon, we had eight hours a day, seven days a week at home for some period. And part of Willie's, Willie was worked at the, at the National Archives, and she had worked on the Elizabeth Cady Stanton collection. She was an amazing, she reorganized Baltimore Yearly Meetings Archives. Mm -hmm. She was brilliant and amazing and funny because when she first had treatment for the cancer, she lost her hair, and she got the most amazing, frightening clown rainbow color. Why? <laughs> because somebody at the archives said, well, don't you think it's about time you started to wear a wig? And she said, okay. <laughs> and she went <laughs> to the party shop and got an afro, an afro neon, right, and right Tina low. Turner with yes. spiky silver, <laughs> five color neon and, and silver. And wore what the one day each, and they said no, you probably don't have to wear it. <laughs> <laughs> she was but oh, that was that was Willie. Oh, that, that was, was Willie. And one well, part of it, she loved. She had two dogs, and she loved them. And one of them was getting quite old. And it was interesting because Midnight waited until she came home and died there with Willie. And it was just one. Was, she, she was, was amazing. Yeah, she was fun. In fact, at, I remember Willie's wake, and I may be remembering the wrong party. Um, maybe we had another party at your place. Probably did it. But, we had many parties um, at her place. <laughs> where but there was only one with turkey, leftover turkey. Yeah. Well, I remember one, and it had to be in a January, and I know Willie was there. But anyway, where we were all sitting around and it was, the, it was the day before the Right to Life March. And we were all saying, and there was a counter demonstration. Or maybe, no, maybe it was just a, maybe it was a pro-choice march in Washington. Anyway, we all looked around and said, you gone? No. You gone? No. You gone? No. And then Willie and Georgia said, our kids are going. We don't have to anymore. <laughs> <laughs> They had grown their own demonstrators. <laughs> so that was, uh, and it was true. I remember one other thing. One of, the, one of the moments I remember most in, I think it was Fairfax 19, or afterwards, working out at Jean Lenses with the feminist envelope sealers and many other things. And the worst thing you could hear was at 10.20 at night, Jean saying, I feel a surge coming on. <laughs> <laughs> and you knew you were in till midnight, one o'clock. You know, it was a morning. Anyway, we used to do these mailings that Miss Mary Ann and, and um, Jean Marshall Crawford were the prime authors of. And we had these huge four page, you remember the four page mailings that you guys thought were, new, were fundraising letters. And half the people who got them thought were. Uh, newsletters. <laughs> they, they were during some of the, the many ERA battles. Anyway, they were fundraising dry, uh, things. And I don't know why we, Jean and I, were opening the, the mail, but we were. Uh, and we got a check for $500. We had never had you know, a $500 check sent back in the mail. And Jean and I looked at it and said, we don't even know who this person is. We didn't even know whether it was a man or a woman. It was Teddy Wood. Oh. But we get a check from Teddy Wood, who we, and Teddy is one of the founding mothers of Mormons, Mormons for, the, for the ERA. ERA. But we didn't know her. Mm -hmm. And to see this check, it was one of the most empowering moments, that, mm -hmm. you know, single moments where somebody out there thought what we were doing was worth that much. And yeah. I will never forget, I went in. You're a $300 total annual budget, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we were running these campaigns on nothing. And I will never forget the first time I met Teddy. Because I had, we had gone to Italy and I came back, uh, and it was right at the time of the NOW conference, and it was up by Capitol Hill, one of the hotels there. And here was this group of women with a big banner that said Mormons for the ERA. And I kind of